Hi guys, welcome back to another online study. We miss you so much and we can't wait to see you again. Um, I hope you guys are just being encouraged through these studies and um, you're just keeping connected to the Lord um, during this time. So let's start in a word of prayer. Father God, we just come before you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you, God, for this day that you've blessed us with, God, for the breath that you put in our lungs, Lord. I just pray, God, that during this time, Lord, that you would just fill us with your spirit, God, and that you would bring us in um, to an awareness of your presence, Jesus, Lord, knowing how much you love us, God, how much you desire to work in our lives, Lord God. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would just give us a heart after your own heart, Lord. We love you and we praise you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I close my eyes. I close my eyes to see my King in majesty your grace compels my soul to love and draw in close I lift my hands and sing Jesus, I surrender. 
caught up. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. And I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh. I'm not here for blessing Cause Jesus you don't know me anything More than anything that you can do I just want you And I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot the oven enough. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm caught up. And I'm caught up in your presence And I just want to sit here at your feet And I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave I'm not here for blessing. Oh, I'm not here for blessings Cause Jesus, you don't know me anything More than anything that you can do I just want you And I just want you and nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you and nothing else, nothing else, Jesus. Nothing else will do, oh, I just want you. And nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do, I just want you. And nothing else, nothing else, Jesus. Nothing else will do. I'm caught up in your presence. And I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings Cause Jesus, you don't know me anything More than anything that you can do I just want you And Father God, we just come before you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you, God, that you have given us the gift of your presence, Lord. Lord, that you never leave us nor forsake us, God. And you continually just pour your love out on us, Father God. That you are never too far away from us, Lord God. 
I thank you, Lord, that you desire a relationship with us, Father God, even though we're just human, God, and we fail all the time, Lord Jesus, but you are there, Father God, to pick us up, Father God. I pray, Lord God, that you would just speak so mightily to us, Father God, in this message, Lord Jesus. I pray, God, that you would meet us where we're at right now, Lord God. Strengthen us, Lord Jesus, by your spirit. Reveal yourself to us, Lord God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening and welcome back to the Resistance High School Ministry here at Calvary Chapel Golden Springs. And again, we are glad to be here and again, miss you guys so much. But we're so thankful that you guys are tuning in faithfully and listening to the services. I apologize in advance for last week. I was a little scatterbrained last week uh, as we were going through that last chapter. And I now remember... Uh, the, the, the phrase I was trying to look for was Messianic Jews. Jews that believe in Jesus are Messianic Jews. So I want to clear that up. It's been bugging me all week, but there it is. Uh, Jews that believe in Jesus are Messianic Jews. So there you go. There was some confusion there as I lost the title. Couldn't figure out the name, but there we are. But if you have your Bibles, open up with me right now to the book of Third John. And as we continue with our study through John's epistles, uh, tonight we're going to be finishing up here in John chapter 3. And uh, where the author here is going to both, he's going to be encouraging and warning a fellow believer in the faith, as well as recommending another to imitate Christ in the midst of false teaching and a non-believing world. And isn't that where we're at right now? There's so many things going on right now, it's interesting. I really feel like uh, this uh, season is coming to an end very soon, this uh, quarantine and us being separated, and I can't wait to see you guys face to face. Can't wait to uh, continue to have fellowship. You know, we have uh, made some decisions about uh, how we're going to minister in the future, and I do believe that our online presence is going to continue, and I think actually it's going to actually uh, progress more. We're going to actually amplify it. We're going to have not only myself, but some of my other leaders are going to be teaching on a more regular basis to put out more content on the Internet because we saw such a huge spike in watchers and viewers of the online services that uh, more than we get usually in the normal youth services throughout the week. So what we want to do is to continue to effectively minister to everybody, not only the people that are coming in the flesh, but also those that are at home and unable to be here. So for those of you guys that are tuning in that are part of our church, God bless you and welcome. For those of you who are not and you're tuning in, God bless you and welcome as well. And I want to get into the study tonight. So as we've been going through uh, uh, John's epistles here, um, it, it's been an interesting thing talking about, remember, remember the whole concept and the whole um, idea was he was combating the Gnosticism, uh, this false uh, philosophy and religion that was entering into the church, uh, basically denying the deity of Jesus Christ. And he's going to now talk about in this last chapter, uh, three examples in action, that's what I'm calling it, examples in action. And he, and he, and he deals with three different people. He uh, recommends one, he uh, uh, rewards another, kind of like uh, commenting on him, and then one he rebukes very, very uh, sharply. And we're going to talk about that. And this is all about relationships and people and ministry and um, the way uh, John uh, did ministry and the, the, uh, the worth and the weight that he put on the people that, uh, that he, that he um, ministered alongside, much like Paul, and we're going to get into that a little bit later. Let's go ahead and read. Uh, in the first verse of chapter uh, 3 of John cha uh, John's epistle, 3. And this is to the elder. The, it says basically the elder, which is John, the beloved. It says, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Now, Gaius, is, there's not a lot written about him. There's a few verses here and there. It is believed. Uh, again, this, this letter was written while, while John was in Ephesus. And, and so... They believe that uh, it was written to a particular leader in the church, a, a believer that was having a fellowship either in his city or in his home, and he was a, uh, a believer of great reputation and uh, much revere from, from John. So he writes this letter to him, and he says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So I like this that right off the bat that John is, is commending this man, Gaius, uh, for being, he's, he's hoping that he's prospering and that he's well in health. But more importantly, he says, just as your soul prospers. In other words, I hope that you are as well in your health and well in your other ways that you are in your spiritual health. And that's a really important thing. You know, I hear uh, and I get a lot of people calling up for spiritual healing all the time, for physical healings. But I always share with them, you know, because I, I, I know a lot of people minister to a lot of people that are physically ill, 
that are sometimes uh, physically limited or incapacitated. Some of them dealing with mental issues. And, you know, um, they're always praying. Some people are always praying, God, heal me. Why hasn't God healed me? I had a phone call this afternoon uh, for a, a person that uh, asked me, why hasn't God healed me? Um, he did drugs for a number of years. And he wanted to know if God was going to, to take away the psychological effects and some of the physical problems that have happened as a result of his drug use. And having spoken to him um, through experience and, and also from myself and others, God does do miracles and God does uh, set people free physically, emotionally, spiritually. The Bible says in Romans, he says, and, and be, um, uh, be conformed or be, I'm sorry, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The word transform means tr completely changed. You're not the person that you used to be, physically, emotionally, or spiritually. And, but, it, but it comes about as, a, as, a, as, a, um, as your mind is renewed in the word of God and the knowledge of, of God. So that being said, I really believe, and what I share with this man, is that um, all of us can be healed. Some of us are going to be healed eternally. Some of us are going to be healed immediately. And some of us, it might take a, a long time for some of those effects of the things we've been abusing ourselves and our bodies uh, with to, to take effect, but eventually we will be set free. And I know people that have been uh, on drugs for a number of years, completely messed up in their heads, and, and, and drunkards and all the rest, and, and, and just perverted people. And yet when they come to Christ, their lives are transformed and changed, and they're turned inside out. They're not the same person that they used to be. And that is the beauty of being a Christian. So I like the fact that he says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. In other words, I pray that you'd be just as strong physically and emotionally as you are spiritually and that is a good thing to pray and then he says for i greatly rejoice when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you man there, and we talked about this last week there's no greater joy for a teacher for a christian for somebody who ministers the word and even as a parent or as a family member when you hear of some of your family and your friends that are walking in the lord years down the road or and, and you know in ministry we see so many people come and go uh, through the ministry, in the ministry, um, participating in it, or coming through the church. And it's really cool when you see somebody that comes over, you know, two, three, four, five years down the road, or even longer, and now they have kids and their family, and they're saying, hey, man, thank you so much for ministering to us. We really enjoyed your studies. We really enjoyed the church. We had such a great time uh, going on the mission trips or whatever. And you see that they're, they're growing uh, spiritually. They have just grown and matured, and they've gone from a, a place of where maybe they were just new believers to all of a sudden now mature believers and they're growing in their faith and it's a blessing. It's like when you see a tree um, that you planted with your own hands. You know, my daughter and I planted an apple tree in our last home and it literally planted it from a seed and it came up and it's a, like, like this little plant and this little plant turned into about a you know two or three foot high tr tree. And um, then we moved into our new house or where we live now about six, seven years ago. And uh, she asked me, can we take it with us? And I said, sure, yeah, no problem, not knowing how deep the roots had gone. Well, I went in there and started digging it up, and the roots had gone really deep, and I cut some of the smaller ones and left the big main uh, uh, ones intact, wrapped it in some soil, brought it back, and, and now it's planted in our backyard right now. And it is, it is growing like crazy. It's got to be about seven or eight feet high. It's not producing a whole lot of fruit right now. They're really small. That has nothing to do with the plant itself. It just has to do with the season and the, wind and the type of weather that we have. But it's interesting that when the apple blossoms begin to bloom, you see all these little white and pink flowers that are going. It's really beautiful. And when I look at that, I'm like, wow, look, it's growing. Now, I'm waiting for it to produce fruit. But I'll tell you what, man, there's no blessing. There's no greater blessing than to see it blossoming. I thought it was going to die. And, and, and sometimes we see people that way, too. You see them after a few years. And they're not really growing. And then all of a sudden, you don't see them for three, four, five years. They come back, and they're just blossomed. They're, they're budding, and they're putting forth so much spiritual fruit. And when John is sharing with his believers, I, I, he says, I found joy when I hear of the faith that is in you and, and, and that it's growing. So I love this part right here. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you. I like this, that John didn't hear it from the people themselves. He heard it from other people that were boasting about the the, the growth in these particular believers. And I think that is cool. That's a testimony. When other people say, hey, man, have you ran into so-and-so? Or have you seen so-and-so? They're really doing well. That's even better because now that witness is not only coming back to you, but it's also going through the people that are reporting it. And it's like a cyclical thing, and people get encouraged by that. When Christians do well, people are encouraged. And I want to encourage you guys, if you're not doing well right now, 
there's one way to fix it. Just go to the throne, ask the Lord, hey, Lord, fix my heart, fix my mind, get back in your word, get back into fellowship with God, eventually get back into fellowship at your church or at least with other believers. If you can't do it in person, then do it online and get back to knowing the God who created you and loved you. You know, um, God never stops loving us and, and God never leaves us or forsakes us, but we can Him. It's very easy for us to break fellowship with God through many different means. We could go off and, and chase our own uh, dragons, so to speak, or, or chase our own trains. We could go down the wrong path. We could make bad decisions. We could walk away from God. But he never leaves us or forsakes us. You say, how is that possible? If I could walk away from him, how is he? How can he near me? He's always following after us. And because he loves you, he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So if you find yourself in a place where maybe, you know, your fellowship or maybe your relationship with God has kind of grown cold, I want to encourage you, it's not that hard to get back. It's really not. People always ask me that. How do I get back? Well, you turn around. The word repent literally means to turn around, to look at your sin, see where you have fallen, see where you've come from, and literally turn back around, like Jesus said in Revelation, and do your first works. Go back to that loving relationship with God and make things whole again. Believe it or not, it can be made whole again. It can be made right again. It can be made fresh again by you merely going back and forsaking your old ways and going back to the presence of God, and it's literally that easy. Again, for uh, verse um, three says, for I greatly rejoice when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I like that. He says, not only have they talked about your truth, but also your faith, but you walking in the truth, and that's what it's all about. It's one thing for a person to go to church, and you have a lot of people that go to church, but walking in truth and going to church are two different things. Mark my words on this. Going to church is good, it's where you go. It's the hospital. You go to get better, get the treatment. But if you go to the doctor's office and the doctor tells you what's wrong or he points out maybe some of the issues that need to be taken care of and then he gives you the medicine, but you go home and you put that medicine on the shelf and don't use it, you're not going to get better. You're going to get worse. And that's how it is with the church sometimes. To walk in truth and to walk to church is two different things. And I think, I hope you guys understand this, that we've been separated from our churches for a couple of months now, and I hope some of you guys are hungry to get back into fellowship in church. But don't get, be hungry to go right back to church and fellowship with believers. Go back, be happy, and be excited about going back to church and fellowshipping with God. Not that you can't do that at home. But it's a com completely different thing to be in the house of God with other believers and fellowshipping together. So I like what he says here. He says that you testified of the truth that is in you just as you walk in the truth. So it's one thing to be in the church. But it's one thing to be in Christ and walking in truth. And that's what we want to be. It says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So John's opening uh, uh, greeting there in the first uh, three, four verses right there. Now he's going to get into recognition. And this is a good thing. I believe that in <clears throat> the work of God and in, in ministry, as, as well as a secular job or sports team or whatever, and you're part of a team, recognition is a good thing. Some people like to rule uh, through fear and intimidation. Some people do so with encouragement and edification. And to be honest with you, both things are needed at times. I'm not saying the fear and intimidation, but at sometimes you need to be strong. But you win more uh, bees with honey, so to speak. You can attract more bees with honey. And this is one of those things that John was really good at, recommending and, and, and recognizing uh, leaders around him and people around him that were, that were walking in God and continuing on in the faith. Paul did the same thing. We're going to touch on that later as we get into Colossians, where Paul is literally talking about, and he lists a whole list of people that he commends and, and gives a shout-out, so to speak, of all his fellow workers. But I like this. This, six, this section right here, Paul confirms that Gaius did right in supporting the teachers who came uh, through his particular city, and it encouraged him to continue this hospital. He's encouraging him to continue the hospitality. Here's what it is. Gaius was uh, living in this particular city. Preachers would come through, itinerant preachers, uh, missionaries, what have you. And any time a, a fellow believer, a Christian, or a missionary, or a teacher would come through, he would put them up in his home or, or take care of their physical or financial needs because th those who live by the gospel shall be you know, basically taken care of by the gospel. And so Gaius was one of those men that was gifted with the gift of hospitality. Now, if you don't know what the gift of hospitality is, it is one of the gifts of the, the 21 gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the gifts of hospitality is God has given you on a hilarious heart 
to give to the needs and meet the needs of other people as God shows you. Now, now you're not walking around with bags of money and just ripping it out and throwing it at everybody, but you see a need like, hey, you know what, uh, that guy over there, um, his parents' car broke down, and maybe the Lord puts it on your heart to go and take care of that guy's broken car so that the family can have a vehicle. Or uh, what has been happening a lot during this whole season is people just going up to random people's houses and leaving bags of groceries knowing that, you know, they need food or giving them a little cash here and there knowing that they're out of work right now. And all these things have been happening. It's been a blessing to see the body of Christ responding as God reveals the needs of other people to them. And rather than say, hey, I'm going to bless you like this, which is a good thing. I'm not saying that's bad. But when they do it hilariously and they do it as unto God, or if you do it openly just wanting to bless somebody, God's going to bless that, especially when you're obedient to it. Because many times God will say, hey, I want you to bless that person, or I want you to encourage that person, I want you to help that person. We're like, oh, yeah, yeah, but i got to help myself first. Well, that's not what it's all about. I know people that have given huge, huge amounts of money and support for other uh, organizations, for missionaries, for people, when they themselves do without. And I think that's a blessing. Now, here in this particular section... Again, he's going to give a shout out to Gaius. He says, Beloved, you do faithfully whenever you do for the brethren and for strangers. I like this. He says, you are doing God's work faithfully when you do what? When you take care of the brethren and when you what? He says, take care of strangers. Now, he's not talking about any stranger. I mean, we live in the age of strangers, right? Every street corner, there's a stranger with a sign that says, I'll work for food. I'll do backflips for food, I'm homeless, or whatever the case. I'm not negating uh, their need or even negating the seriousness of their situation or circumstance. Every each one is different. But I am saying this. We have to exercise so much wisdom and, and understanding and discernment in these latter days because there are a lot of people out there claiming to be something that they're not, especially the homeless population. The truth is, when you're entertaining strangers, he's talking about those that come in the name of the Lord. Those that are coming and they're ministering the word of God, this is what he's talking about. People that you don't even know, but they're Christians, but God puts it on your heart to take care of. And this is what he's saying to Gaius. Beloved, you do faithfully whenever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. Look, he says, they themselves have spoken to you of your great love, not only for them, but of God and the way that you ministered to them. You know, uh, we get a lot of um, feedback from uh, a lot of pastors and a lot of lay, uh, leaders and people that are in ministry, whenever we do our conferences every year, or when even just the normal people that come to the church, and we get this a lot, like, man, I, I, when I come to the church, I feel so loved, man. Um, they, they came in, they asked me if I needed a seat. Uh, they told me where the bookstore was. They helped my mom get a translator for her. Uh, they helped my grandpa go to his uh, seat because he's, he's impaired and can't walk. The ushers were really kind to me. And that's a good thing. We want to be a loving church. And we want to be people that minister to the, to the needs of the people. Now, we are not God. We are not going to be able to meet every need. That's not our purpose and that's not uh, uh, what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to point people to the Lord so that the Lord will meet their needs. Now, the Bible says not to let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And we want to make sure that we do that. But the truth is, we are here to be God's hands and to be God's feet and to be God's ears and his mouth and to literally speak to the people and minister to the people as we're being ministered to by the Lord. And whatever capacity God has you, this is what we're supposed to do. And Gaius was faithful in doing that. He saw the needs as God brought them to his attention and he met those needs. And I think that's a really cool thing. And look what he says here again. And he says again, um, uh, Beloved, you do faithfully whenever you do for the, whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God. I like that. Send them forward. In other words, it's kind of like pay it forward, so to speak, if you really want to think about it. What he did was these people were coming through his area. They were preaching. They were teaching. They were living just off the gospel, doing what they were doing. And he wanted to ease their burden. Remember, these guys are travelers. It wasn't like they were on a bus or had a plane and maybe they needed a little bit of money to, to go on to the next city. Maybe he gave them meals or a place to sleep or maybe a warm cloak or whatever their case may be. He saw their needs immediately. And as they were coming through, he, rec he recognized that as a man or a per or woman is serving the interests of God's kingdom, it is our responsibility as Christians to help take care of their needs on earth. Now, this is how the church operates. Um, the tithings that are received from the body Every day, those tithings are not, they don't go into our pockets, so to speak. They don't. 
What they do is they go into the offering boxes. That's true. All your offering and boxes. Why does God say that you are to give a tenth or that he asks you for a tenth of your, of your income? The word tenth uh, means a tithe or a tithe means a tenth, excuse me. And is it God needs it? Is it does God have an ever-growing bank account in the bank of heaven and he needs your money to depend on whether he- heaven can, can, you know, meet their budgets and their quota? No. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the hills, owns the planet which the hills are on and every other planet in the solar system. Gold is as, uh, uh, as, as concrete or tiles on the ground in the kingdom of God. And, and the gates of heaven are made of two giant pearls. He, he, he does that to show us that the things that we hold as value and worth in this planet, in this world, in this, in this being that we are, is not the same in heaven. They're, they're building, they're construction materials. The thing that God holds of worth are not things made with hands. They're not gold and, or, or things that are, that are ore or, 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 or jewels or any of those things. What he holds of value is human souls and people. He holds those above everything else. Matter of fact, he created gold and silver and the earth and the mountains and, and everything that's in it for the enjoyment of man. But they are not to be idols to man. Matter of fact, we're not supposed to have any idols. He literally made this earth so that we could live here until the time that we go on to live with him. This is a temporary space. That'd be like you dying and saying, before I die, I want to take my bed with me because it's so comfy. No, you leave the bed behind because you're going on to a place where you're not going to need it anymore. Well, this is a place where right now we need these things. But when we go on to eternity, we don't need gold or silver. We don't need a bed or a car, any of those things, because we're going to have better and things that are way more important in the kingdom of God. Are you tracking with me there? So he talks about this here. And again, he says, um, he says right here, pay it forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God. Now, what is a manner worthy of God? In other words, from the heart, with sincerity, and without prejudice. That's how God wants us to, 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 to serve and to, to meet people's needs. And he says right here, you will do well. He says, if you do these things, then you do well. He says, because they went forth uh, for his name's sake, talk, taking nothing from the Gentiles, we therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers of the truth. I like what he says right here. He's literally making the point that as they're going forward in the work, let's say you and I can't go to Africa. We can't go to South America. We can't go to China or anywhere to do missions work, right? This is how the body of Christ works. We are not an organization. Some people turn the church into an organization. It is not. The church is an organism. Look it up. The definition is completely different. An organization is a bunch of individual organisms coming together and working for a purpose like a task, almost like a bee's hive, so to speak. You have one queen and a bunch of workers that are, that are serving the need of the queen. That's not what the church is. We are more of an organism. An organism is a bunch of individual cells that all to be- together combine one body. And although some of those cells and some of those members have different functions and different purposes, together they serve one purpose, and that is to glorify God, to build up the entire body, and to encourage and to feed the rest of the body. In other words, to give them the gifts and the talents necessary to worship God and to get closer to God. So we are an organism, not an organization. And the organism is dependent upon individual cells. Paul talks about this and the different members of the body of Christ. The body is made up of many different members, but the arm can't say to the, you know, the arm can't say to the leg, I have no use for you. Think about how hard that would be to walk around uh, with one leg. It would be very difficult. There are many people that do it. They are definitely challenged in those areas. But God gave us a balance that the hand has a purpose, the mouth has a purpose, the eyes have a purpose, the ears have a purpose. But guess what? Let's say you had eyesight, but you were unable to speak, so all the things that you saw, you would be unable to communicate those verbally. You would have to paint pictures. You would have to do sign language to show people what you were seeing because you wouldn't be able to speak. But God made it so that what we see, we're able to think about it, we're able to meditate on those things and then verbalize with our mouth. And so the whole body works together in perfect unison. And he says this, and he uses the human body as kind of like an example of how the church is. It's an organism with many different members and many different cells that are together, that come together for a purpose, and that purpose is to please God. Now, with that, I like what he says here. You and I, when we give and when we help and when we minister to the needs of other people, 
that are involved in the work of God. Let's say you're at home and you're giving your tithing to your church. Those tithings are going not to only to pay for this, the recording and the, the internet and the social media stuff that, that's going on behind the scenes, all of the production aspects of it, but the lights that are on, the air conditioning that's on, the electricity that runs all the equipment, and the ability for us to actually put out the content. Not only that, but also the, the, the proceeds are given so that the family members that are doing that work are taken care of in their families. Now, we're not rich. We're not fleecing the flock. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the things I love about the church is that we're very, like, across the board, even when it comes to salaries and comes to pay, because those things are, are, are expected. I mean, the Bible says that a worker is worthy of his wages. We're not making $60 million a year, you know, preaching the gospel and flying around the earth on our Learjet, although that would be nice. We don't have those kind of things. But here's the cool thing we do. God meets our daily needs just as he does yours. I tithe to my church, and I tithe to missionaries and other people just like you do. Just because I'm in ministry doesn't mean I'm, I'm you know, exempt from giving or from uh, 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 tithing as well. As a matter of fact, I think we do more. The reason why is because as much is given, much more is required. Now, with the tithe, let me tell you how it works. So as you're obedient to the Lord and you're giving your 10%, it goes to your church or to whatever organization, and they use that for the work of ministry. And a majority of that work is, is, is done and lots of different things that you wouldn't even expect. But in the essence, it's all going to fund God's work. Because the truth is, does God need our money? No, God could bring it out of nowhere. If you've ever uh, read some of these, these famous preachers from the old days that literally just believed by faith, like George Mueller, these guys just would just pray and God would provide for them. But God would use material things to meet human needs, because that's the way it is. If a man's hungry, it'll say, oh God, take away his hunger. He can do that, but he's going to die. He can take away the hunger desires, but he's going to die because the physical body needs physical food, just like a physical body needs physical clothing and, and shelter from the elements and whatnot. So the truth is God uses the things of this world to meet the needs of human beings. Now, we are not, again, like I said, to make those things idols. We are not to worship those things and to amass those things and put emphasis on those things. Their needs and there's necessities, but the true necessity and need comes from our, our necessity for God. To put all of our focus on God and he meets our needs. When Jesus told the disciples, seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Think about that. He's saying you get the relationship vertically and he'll take care of everything horizontally. And it's just funny how it just happens to form a cross. In other words, you put your relationship with God first and God will make sure that all your other needs are in order. Now ask yourself that. Am I in need in any area? Have I been, um, you know, am I missing in some things that are not being taken care of or neglected? Is, is, now you have to ask yourself, is it because your relationship with God is not on char or not on point? Because if you're not right with God, sometimes he <laughs> makes it known through the different little things upon the earth, like your bills aren't being paid, or you're not getting along with this person, or you're not taking care of these things, because all those things are connected. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. In other words, he says, you take care of me, and I'll take care of you. And that's the beauty of, of the things that we have in Christ and, and how he takes care of us. So I like what he says here, and getting to the main point of right here in verses 5 through 8, he says, we ought to, verse um, 8, we therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers in the truth, or for the truth. Now, did you know that by you tithing and by you being faithful to what God has called you to do in offerings and tithes and even in your service you know you don't have any money let's say you don't have any money and and you can't tithe you know I hear people say this my, my bills are really tight well just because your bills are tight does not mean that God does not require that 10 percent by faith you're like wait a minute if I give the tithe I won't be able to pay my bills if I pay my tithe I won't be able to pay my car insurance well let me ask you a question what things could you cut out? Well, I'm already, you don't know me, Pastor. I don't, I don't have anything as it is right now. I, I believe that. There are a lot of people that live, like many people I know and even myself, by every cha paycheck. We take paycheck to paycheck. We take care of our needs. We take care of God first and then of all our needs and whatever's left over, we have left over. If we don't have anything left over, God takes care of our need for the next month. I get that. But sometimes God asks us to do it by faith. Give your tithing and then pray, God, I, I've done what was required of you. Now, if you would please meet my needs, as in the, the Bible says that. Give us this day our daily bread. What do you think that means? When he's praying that, that psalm, literally he's saying, God, 
uh, I'm going to give to you and you're going to give to me what I need, my daily bread, just my daily. Don't give me what I need for tomorrow. Just take care of my needs for today, right? And that's an important thing. But I want you to point out something that's really important. By you being faithful to offer your tithes and your offerings to the Lord, not to our church, not to anyone here. I'm saying to where the Lord directs you, you're in essence a part of the ministry. This is what I love it. Remember I told you the organism thing? You're a part of the church. If you're home right now and you're watching and you're listening, you're a part of this work as Raul is preaching, as I am teaching, as anybody else because through your faithfulness, we're able to continue what God is doing. And that's an important thing. You see, when we get to heaven, God's going to be like, did you ever preach the word? You're like, ah, I shared with a few people. But you could say, and, and, and God's going to say, good and fa- well done, that good and faithful servant. You're like, how so? Well, well, every time you gave your tithe, let me tell you where every one of your dollars went or every time your, your pennies went, whatever it was. The money you, you gave went to the church and they siphoned off a little bit of that and gave it to you. Siphon's a weird word, but they sectioned some of that off and gave it to a missionary in Africa or in, in Uganda or in China or, or they built a church in Mexico or South America. And through your faithfulness, every month, they were able to cut off a little bit and give it to these missionaries. And there are 700 or 1,000 or six people that got saved as a result of the work of that church that was a work of your faithfulness and giving your tithe. So we don't think about it that way. We don't think about our pennies, our dollars, our little things going somewhere, but we don't ever realize that we're part of a team. We are a huge part of a team. I'm not talking about Calvary Chapel, Golden Springs. We're, we're part of a bigger team. We're part of a, a global, eternal society of God's people that we are literally paying into, not with finances. And this is what I wanted to hit. Let's say you don't have the finances. You just don't have it. And, I, and God knows your heart. But you really want to give back. Did you know that you can serve God in so many different ways? And I'm not talking about coming over and cleaning bathrooms because the church is closed right now. But how about in prayer? Did you know that your prayers are worth more than gold? Your prayers, if faithfully executed and done so in a way that is given over the Lord, your prayers can do more than hundreds of billions of dollars. Now, there are people in the world who say, you're a fool. Are you telling me that one lady praying in her basement is going to do more than my $500 million can do? I can go over and I can start an entire country, can you? That money will be wasted in a, in a, in a day. But prayers are, are eternal, and they go up before the King of kings and the Lord of lords who is eternal and has control and authority over all things. And my God can supply the needs of many or few by just one prayer. So your service to God is not limited to solely by giving. It is not limited solely by serving with your hands. Sometimes it is just on your knees praying. Some of the greatest rewards are going to be awarded in the kingdom of God to people who couldn't even walk. They sat or they laid in their bed every day and prayed six, seven hours a day faithfully for family members and loved ones and missionaries whom they've never met all over the world and God is going to count their service as a crown of gold. Why? Because they did so hidden from the eyes of men and doing it before the throne of God. And I'll tell you something. I want to be one of those guys. I want to be one of those people that the Lord says, well, good and thou faithful servant. Not serving in the eyes of man, because it's easy, but in in the hidden part of our heart. And and when we're doing stuff uh, just just because we want to serve and and honor the Lord. So I love this part. That we therefore ought to receive such that we may also become fellow workers uh, for the truth. He says when we receive these people and when we help them on their way, when we help meet their needs, we're a part of the work even though we're not on the road going to minister or, do, or doing those things that the pastors or the preachers or the missionaries are doing. We're literally helping them on their way and so we're a part of that organism that we talked about earlier uh, of the body of Christ. So it's beautiful. Here in verses 9 through 10, he's going to talk about now a rebuke. A rebuke and a reproof. So the first one was a recognition we got three R's here, four if you count it. One is a recognition of Gaius in verses one, uh, of chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Now we're going to saw the rebuke and reproof of uh, 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 Diotrephes in uh, verses 9 through 10. Now, Diotrephes is an interesting character. He was a guy who was in the church, but his motives were not for God. His motives were for himself. And when Paul, excuse me, Paul, when John wrote a letter to the churches to encourage them, he wouldn't read the letter. He wouldn't allow the words to be read because he didn't want anybody to look at anybody but himself. Now, unfortunately, there are people in the world today, uh, not only in government 
and in, in positions at your job. Maybe you know if you, maybe you're that person where you always have to have the recognition. You always have to be the chief that's, that's calling the shots and you don't want anybody else having any kind of influence or any kind of say because it takes away from your authority and you want to be the man. Well, Diatrophes was one of those guys and, and, and John has a swift and, and, and sharp rebuke and repute proof against him. And let's read that, what it says here in, um, in verses uh, 9 and 10. And he says right here, again, he said, he, uh, this is to express his concern over Diotrephes for rejecting John and others whom they should have received. So in other words, these leaders were coming through, and instead of receiving them like, like Gaius did, he was rejecting them, saying, nah, I got nothing to do with it. Who are you, so to speak? And look what it says. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. In other words, this guy Diotrephes was actually a blocker. He was in the middle and in front, and he would not allow Paul, excuse me, John's letter to be read, and he was not allowing these, these ministers to come through and taking care of their needs. As a matter of fact, he's like, no, we got to take care of us first. And, no, you t-, and he wouldn't even regard John in any kind of authority. And look what John says to him. Therefore, if I come, and he's like saying, when I get, you remember when you were a kid and you did something wrong? Your mom's like, when your dad gets home, you're like, oh no, right? This is kind of what John's saying. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does. Now, now I wonder what John was going to do. If he stepped up there and said, hey man, Diotrephes, I'm here, man, what's going to happen? Was Diotrephes and him going to square off and, you know, like, kind of like, you know, a little uh, a duel in the street, so to speak? I think he was going to rebu- rebuke him. And reveal to him who he really was. He really didn't love the people. He really didn't love God. He was all worried about his own position and his own authority. But the truth is, you guys, it has to be about uh, God's ways. And I like what he says here. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. In other words, he doesn't receive us personally. He doesn't take care of our needs. He doesn't recognize us as authority. So what was he doing? He was elevating himself. Who else do you know that elevates himself and will not receive the rebu- rebuke or correction. Sounds like Satan to me, right? Lucifer, when he said, I will rise above the, you know, the clouds and I will sit on the mountain of the Most High. And he said the five eyes and God cast them down. Sounds very similar. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. So uh, apparently this guy was slandering John and the disciples saying, these guys aren't workers of God. I'm, if you want to see a real worker of God, look at me. Here I am in the church all the time, serving constantly, never going home, and ministering to people faithfully. And he's kind of calling people to himself instead of pointing people to the Lord. That's one thing you want to know. That's an earmark of a false teacher. When they become so insecure, when they become so worried that other people are going to quote-unquote steal their thunder or take their limelight or somebody has more followers on Instagram or somebody listens to their studies more than theirs. That's an insecure person that's not putting their faith in Christ but are are worried about their own self-image. And this is what Diotrephes was all about. So he says, therefore, when I will come and call his deeds to mind, which he does, and he says, prating against us with malicious words and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. So he's saying, hey, don't let those people stay at your house. If they stay at your house, you're not welcome at our church anymore. Hey, they're from a different church, and they preach something different. We don't even know what fellowship they're from, so don't, don't have them in your home. Don't feed them. Don't associate with them. And how many people have you seen like that before? Because maybe, and I've heard people say, you're from Calvary? Oh, we don't like Calvary because Calvary believes X, Y, Z. Whatever. I've seen people do that with Baptists or Presbyterians or Catholics even. Dude, believers are believers in Jesus Christ. If you believe that Jesus came, Lord God and Savior, came as a man in the flesh but was 100% God, died on a cross, resurrected, and lives again at the right hand of God, sits, and we are all part of his kingdom. Our names are written in the book of life. You are a believer. I don't care what church you go to. If you believe those simple things, we might have some variations of, of differences about when the Lord's going to come back or maybe some of the signs of, or, or, or the operations of the gifts. That's okay. Those are things that we could disagree on, but you know what? And they're not things that are essential for salvation. I like what Paul says, don't worry, don't major in the minors, so to speak. You guys, there's a huge family of believers that are divided over doctrinal little things or little teachings or misunderstandings on, on, on scriptures and, and, and definitions of things. So not important. In the scheme of eternity, we're all going to be in the presence of God and we'll all know the truth at that one time, who was right and who was wrong, and it doesn't make a difference because Jesus is right. And I like this. 
He says again, prating himself against us with malicious words and not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. So beware of those kind of people. And he rebukes and reproofs uh, um, um, this guy Diotrephes. Now John is going to re- give a commendation or a recommendation to Demetrius. I have a good friend named um, Demetrius. He's a pastor of a church in Pomona. He's a great guy. I've known him for years. Uh, he just took over our little Calvary, our little church, and he's a neat guy, man. He's just starting from the ground up, trying to build his church. And man, he's just—he's like a, a man with a plow, you know. He's just plowing that field out there and building up this church. It's a small little fellowship, but I have no doubt if his faithfulness is continued and he continues to love God and his family, that God is going to grow that church. But his name is Demetrius, and whenever I read this, I think about him. I talked to him this morning on the phone. Then it says, here Paul wants to encourage Gaius to imitate what is good, and he wants to commend Demetrius as a good example. So he, he kind of hits two guys in this one particular passage in two verses. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Now, this is a, a challenge, I believe, in the church today. When people want to imitate the world and use it for godly gain. I've heard of people doing stuff like this. Hey, we should do this because I saw this in this one particular place, and they had a lot of people show up, and we got a celebrity up there, and they got them. And, and man, we got to be careful of those kind of things. Using worldly means to, to, uh, to go about God's uh, divine purposes. We don't need that. God could work outside of that. Can he use it? Yeah, but I think the results and the fruit that are going to be bared from it won't be lasting fruit and uh, honestly won't be anything in the kingdom of God that you're going to be able to even see the, the results of. But beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. You know, too many times today through Instagram and social media, we like to follow and emulate these people in the world that do nothing but evil things. Musicians and sports heroes and and athletes and, and actors and and, and online personalities and people get famous on TikTok doing stupid stuff and like oh, I'm a celebrity really not really you did some dumb stuff or you're really cute and a lot of people follow you so all of a sudden you're famous and make a bunch of money but the truth is what have you really done you know I'm always uh, uh, um, correcting people that are that are always about the social media following people and and getting on and and and, and idolizing these people because they're imitating literally when you're when you're idolizing people it's because you like what they're doing. And you want to do the same, but you can't. So basically, you follow them vicariously. And here's the sad thing. By liking and, 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 and commenting on those things, do, not, do we not become just like them and the evil that they're doing? Because we're condoning it. Maybe we're not ourselves doing it, but they are. And we say, hey, we like that. Then it's, it's basically saying, you know, what they're doing is right, even though it's wrong. We need to be careful of that. It says, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God. In other words, he practices of good, but is of God. But he who does evil has not seen God. Now, he's not talking about the somebody who eventually, you know, occasionally, uh, you know, transgresses every once in a while or, or falls into, uh, you know, an occasional sin. He's talking about someone who continually does evil. He's talking about someone who practices sin. Galatians says, he who practices these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And he lists a whole bunch of different things. He's talking about people that put those into practice, not people that occasionally fall into temptation and trial. That's different. Christians are not sinless. And you're going to hear me say this a lot. Everybody that deals with a lot of uh, condemnation because they mess up every once in a while, because they trip and fall, and because they make a mistake, that is not what you're going to be judged for. And and none of us are going to be judged for those things. You're going to sin, but we have the blood of Christ that washes us and cleanses us from all sin. We have the Holy Spirit that convicts us of great sin or trespass, and He leads us and guides us in all love and, 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 and calmness into a way of reconciliation with God. He, 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 his gentleness of His Spirit basically like loves us as a loving Father back into the fold and says, Hey, don't go that way again. Remember what happened last time. And he, and he loves us back into the kingdom of God. He's not beating us over uh, the head of, of all the mistakes that we've made. But so he's talking about here about somebody that continues in sinful practices. And this is what he's saying right here. And again, he says, um, Demetrius has a good testimony. He says, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Uh, don't imitate what is evil, but what is good. For he who does good is not of God. And he who does uh, evil is not of God. 
Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself. And we also bear witness and, and you know that our testimony is true. We testify of him and God testifies of him. And he says, and the way that he walks in truth testifies of him. So you have three there that are witness of Demetrius' life before Christ. He walks in the truth. He has a good testimony amongst the other believers. And we ourselves have given testimony that this man is true. So he's actually recommending Demetrius that when he comes through, Gaius, make sure that you receive this man, love on this man, and make sure that you take care of him because he's one of us and he's doing a good work for God. So I like that, that, that John does that. In Hebrews chapter 6, 11 through 12, and it says, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, and that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And then, if you remember this, he goes into Hebrews chapter 11, the, the hall of faith, so to speak, when he's talking about all the different examples of people that through faithful obedience receive the blessings from God. Now, I like what he says right here in, um, in, in this chapter in Hebrews uh, 6, 11 through 12, that we desire that each one of you show the same diligence. In other words, that you guys continue to be diligent in your faith, he says, to the full assurance of hope until the very end. In other words, we're to be faithful to the Lord until the end of time or to the end of our life, whatever comes first. And look what he says. And that you do not become sluggish. Don't get lazy. Don't become slothful in the work of God and your diligence of seeking Him. Too, but too often, we see a lot of young people doing that. A lot of people in general. They used to be on point for God, and then you see, how you doing? Ah, I'm not feeling it right now. As if it's some kind of a fad, you know? No, we are to push forward and keep striving towards the Lord all the time. Do we get moody? Yes. Do we sometimes lose the fire? Yes. How do you make a fire bigger? You add more fuel to it. You get closer to the heat. And that's how you do it. You add more fuel to the fire. How do you add fuel to the fire? Get closer to the Lord. Start pouring into the Lord, getting close to Him. And you guys, before you know it, that passion is going to be there again. Don't become sluggish. He says, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You always walk in the footsteps of those that are following Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus, but follow the man in front of you that's walking with the Lord. Paul often recommended and praises fellow servants in Colossians, one of my favorite books, uh, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, he, he goes through a lot. I'm going to just mention just a few. Timothy and Epaphras. We give thanks. He, he writes this letter to Timothy, right? He says, We give thanks to you to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, for which you heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it also is in all the world, and bringing forth fruit, as it is also among since you since um, excuse me among you since the day you heard it and knew of the grace of truth of the God of uh, grace of God in truth, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. So he is talking about Epaphras, and Epaphras is talking about the Colossians, and Paul is talking to Timothy about the same thing. Then in Colossians 4, the latter part of that book, 4, four verses uh, 7 through 15, chapter 4, 7 through 15, he, he names a bunch of them, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. He will tell you of all the news about me. In other words, he's going to come and tell you about what's going on with me. I'm sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your heart. So I'm sending you, Tychicus, I'm in prison, I can't do anything. I'm going to send him to you. To encourage you, he's going to be encouraged by what he sees. He's going to encourage you by what he's seen in me. And all of us are going to be encouraged together. It's pretty cool. And then he says right here, and they says that we may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. In other words, again, he's, he's talking about now Onesimus. And they will make known to you all the things which are happening here. In other words, they're going to bring a good report of all the things that God is doing here. And this is cool because that's what happens when we go to a missions trip or when we go to visit another church. We're always talking about what God is happening and what God is doing there amongst them. So he's making mention of it. He even mentions Lydia, a woman, a, a, a wealthy woman that lived in the city and she was a seller of purple. Uh, she was one of the disciples as well, one of the, uh, the people that followed uh, uh, the Lord in, the, in that book of Acts chapter 16, I believe. And then it's in verse 10, he says, and Articus, our, 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 our Stichius, I'm sorry. 
Aristarchus. There you go. That's better. Sorry about my pronunciation skills are not too well. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, also greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. And we know John Mark, you know, was one of his guys that uh, he had a falling out with and eventually, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Barnabas, and he, and, he, and he welcomes him back in later on and they become uh, servants as well in Mark 2 about who you receive instructions that if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, there it is, another one. There are, are, there are they, these are my only fellow workers uh, for the kingdom of God, who are of the circumcision. These were particular Jews that were serving Jesus as Christians. And they have proved to be a comfort to me. So he's giving them a shout out, so to speak. And then he says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ greets you, always laboring fervent for you in prayers. Look at that. His work was in prayer. He was a prayer warrior. That you may stand perfect. And here's what he was praying for them. That they may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Man, that is a prayer, isn't it? Here's what my prayer is going to be for you guys. Lord, let them grow in faith. Let them stand strong in their walk with God. And let them love God with all their heart. That's a great prayer. That's going to be my new prayer for the year for the youth ministry and for the, for the leaders and for the people, man, that we would continue to grow in his love and stand perfect in him. I like what he says here again. For I bear witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Her- Heropolis. Now, he's talking about his zealousness to minister to the people of those two cities. So he's loving on this guy for his faithfulness to the sheep that God has given him. And Luke, the beloved physician. Anybody heard of Luke before, right? Have you read his gospel? It's amazing, right? He was a doctor. He took care of Paul. And he says, and Demas greets you. Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church that is in his house. So this guy, Nymphus, was apparently a, a guy who had a home fellowship in his house. And he was a well-known man to uh, Paul. And he loved the Lord. And so Paul gives him a shout out all. So you see here, that it's not old. And it's, it's a good thing for leaders, especially like John or for Paul, to, to minister to those who are faithfully ministering alongside the gospel. Even if they're not face-to-face, just like you are serving the Lord. But we're not here face-to-face. I like these last verses, John's hope. I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with a pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly that we shall speak face to face. And I, wrote, I, I read this verse to you guys a couple weeks ago. This is our prayer, man. We can't wait till we can see you guys face to face. No more video. No more. We are still going to do video. We're still going to do online content. But man, how sweet it's going to be when we get to have that fellowship together. Peace to you. Our friends greet you and greet the friends by name. Um, I like John. I, I like John that, that he writes this letter. I like and I pray that you guys are all well, um, not only physically, like John said in the beginning, but also, more importantly, spiritually. And that may, may this time, you guys, as we're all separated physically, may we continue to follow after Jesus with all of our heart and our might and soul. He's the author and finisher of our faith, you guys. He is the one that, that has our whole life written out, and it's a beautiful thing. And I pray that we would all grow deeper in love with him. We are here at the Resistance in Calvary Chapel, Golden Springs. We love you and we do miss you and can't wait till we can see you guys face to face. And until that time, we'll be praying for you. God bless you guys. Have a good night.